My first Olympus digital camera was the C1400, and that was back in 1998. Those were the halcyon days when we got excited about taking digital photographs with a 1.4 million pixel camera, even though we were still deeply entrenched in film photography, which the new millennium would unexpectedly sweep away. Not having the hardware any longer, I am unable to access these images as they are stored on zip cartridges. Later, I crafted my digital skills with the C2500, followed by the E10 and the E20, the last Olympus camera having a fixed lens, before they launched their first DSLR, solving instantly a major problem that still bedevils other makes today. All Saints Church at Howard, taken with the C2500, has made a good job of balancing the exposure streams between the dark interior and much brighter window. Some work on Adobe Photoshop Lightroom was necessary. The E1 launched in 2003 is now regarded as a classic. But its merits were not appreciated at the time because its pixel count of 5 million was thought to be insufficient for quality photography. Olympus did not advocate the use of film lenses on a digital camera, even those regarded as tried and trusted, and still don't, even though the market forced them to make available an adapter for their film lenses. Because the format had changed, a standard lens worked more like a telephoto, hardly satisfactory, and not only on Olympus cameras. Furthermore, the way a digital lens delivers light to a sensor is different to a lens designed for film photography. Olympus designed the E1 from a blank sheet of paper as a digital camera, not a film camera so it had a smaller sensor. An integral part of its design was to solve the problem of dust reaching the sensor when changing lenses by protecting it with a dust filter. Because the E1 used lenses designed for digital photography, the image quality even with 5 million pixels was good enough for quality work such as magazine and book covers. I also appreciated the extra depth of field that four thirds gave in low light when working with maximum apertures without bumping up the ISO. Even balancing contrast with today's high tech cameras is a challenge, yet in 2003, without the benefit of HDR, this was still possible, albeit with a bit of Lightroom jiggery pokery in post production. I still have my E1 and the original Four Thirds lenses, and they work perfectly on Micro Four Thirds cameras, but with an adapter. Olympus kept loyal to their core photographers by designing new cameras that were future-proof without sacrificing what had gone before. Here are a few 9-18 Four Thirds lens shots taken with a Micro Four Thirds OMD camera. The e-system continued until the launch of Micro Four Thirds in 2009, culminating with the E3. These images taken at St. Conan's Kirk Loch Awe are all handheld. By now, Olympus had added the image stabilizer to the camera body, and the effective compensation range was up to five EV stops.
The first Olympus Micro Four Thirds camera, a technology developed jointly with Panasonic, was the Pen EP1 in 2009. The sensor format is identical to the E system, micro referring to the overall smaller size of the camera achieved by removing the mirror. The viewfinder was now live, that is, it read from the camera's computer, and any changes to exposure could be previewed before the shot was taken. I tried one briefly at Conway, and despite the camera's smaller design, the shots were excellent. The pen has undergone many developments over the years. In 2019, I borrowed the EPL9 from Olympus. I set it up in my favourite coffee shop, and the first trial shot was a discreet selfie. Now how's that for vanity? Smartphones have an important part to play in today's social photography. However, anyone looking for a camera more suitable for shooting subjects like wildlife, sport, or in low light without flash, require from the photographer a greater degree of control and knowledge. The pen should be considered, or, as we shall shortly see, the EM10 in the OMD range, if a DSLR is found to be too large and heavy. I took the EPL9 to the Yorkshire Dales, finding it excellent and very versatile for shooting indoors in low light at the hotel and at Studley Royal Church in the Fountains Abbey estate, where the efficient image stabilisation also permitted handheld long shutter speeds to blur water. Earlier I visited Passable Gardens for a more traditional photographic subject. The first pen did not replace the E3 DSLR camera. That came later, with the EM5, which was much smaller than its counterpart. Its kit lens was the 12 to 50, an underrated optic, and I believe no longer in production. If you have one, hang on to it, even though you lose two stops between wide angle and telephoto. I found it excellent for landscapes, and it had a macro switch, very handy when you didn't want to chop and change lenses. Like the 14-42 pancake lens supplied with the EM10, it performs much better than expected, defying its status as a kit lens. Aimed at the dedicated photographer, the EM5 was the first camera in the OMD range. As with the pen, it used Micro Four Thirds technology, thus allowing a broad range of lenses and accessories to work on both systems, even though occasionally the ergonomics presented a challenge. I used the EM5 for many years, eventually upgrading to their professional model, the weather-resistant EM1, which I once demonstrated by standing in a waterfall. I also acquired the EM10, the entry-level model and smallest in the range that can easily be tucked into a jacket pocket when not in use. Talking of size, back in 2016, Olympus launched an upmarket, beautifully engineered variation of the pen, the Pen F. It was tiny, smaller than the EM10, and ideal for street photography. Not my scene, but I had a go, and it was good for landscapes too. The decision for Olympus to go its own way with four-thirds and micro four-thirds was met with cynicism by photographers who preferred larger 
formats, resulting in opinions not always founded on what can be achieved in practice. They thought that the technology could not possibly support A3 prints or publication in any form. This is nonsense. Perhaps they were getting worried, and they had good reason to be. Accuse me of being equally ignorant, but through practice gained by experience, I have successfully seen my Olympus digital images reproduced in quality publications, including books and magazine front covers, even when the science says no. A prime example about the benefit of designing a digital camera from scratch is the image stabilizer. If it is in the lens, then the image stabilization only works for that optic. Olympus put the stabilizer in the camera, and it works with most Zuiko lenses. Immediately, the photo soothsayers were pontificating that it wouldn't be so effective. Nonsense again. Profiting from its initial design, a sophisticated set of contacts between camera and lens allowed adjustments to be made by the camera according to lens choice. But it didn't stop there. When some Zuiko Pro lenses, such as the celebrated 12 to 100, appeared with their own image stabilizer, it didn't represent a change of heart. Instead, Olympus had another revolutionary trick up their digital sleeve. By combining the working of two stabilizers into one that increased the EV compensation to 6.5 stops, it became possible to take sharp, handheld images at shutter speeds up to an unbelievable half a second and beyond, making the use of a tripod unnecessary. Here are a selection of handheld church interiors taken with the EM1 Mark II and the 12 to 100 Pro lens. A digital camera designed from a blank sheet of paper allowed Olympus to plan ahead for future technical advances such as pro capture and focus stacking and a range of large aperture prime lenses. King's College Chapel in Cambridge does not allow the use of tripods, but that didn't bother me. However, being a traditionalist, I prefer to rely on my knowledge of metering modes, shutter speeds, and apertures for results. I could use HDR for high dynamic images, but I prefer to do it manually, and OMD cameras still give me that choice. The biggest threat to the quality camera market is the smartphone and today's perception of photography. It has already ousted most of the compact camera market, but the Olympus Tough range has so far survived the ordeal, but I haven't tested it yet in a waterfall. Much depends on what the photographer wishes to achieve, and what happens to the image afterwards. Will it just sit on a hard disk, all forgotten? If, however, it is your ambition, photo libraries are not keen on accepting smartphone images, and neither are my publishing clients. But when they do, it is only because the photograph shows something unique and not available on a larger format. In order to compete with smartphone technology, 
and I do have one, cameras must be able to offer images of uncompromising quality for the committed photographer. Video 2 was added to the mix. Its quality now good enough for projection in the company of still images. The removal of the mirror back in 2009 and possibly earlier by other manufacturers represented a huge step forward. Since the advent of the DSLR, we were content to compose our images with an optical finder, but it was only an extension of the human eye, and there was nothing better. Mirrorless changed that allowing us to preview the image from the camera's computer, plus any changes like white balance before it was taken. Here, the quality digital camera market is still supreme, a challenge that Olympus rise to and continue to do so in many ways. Maybe the list of future innovations should include the ability of a real camera to make a telephone call or surf the net. That would send huge waves across the market.